Well, hello and welcome to this excerpt from this morning service at Gardenia Street Presbyterian Church in Blackburn. The uh, audio line didn't receive the uh, text this morning, so I'm recording this and hopefully it'll be uploaded so you can catch up with where we are. We've been looking at the Book of Acts when I was with you last, some well, it was a month ago now, and I wanted to pick up on the story of Philip before we move into, as you can see, the uh, next section of Acts, which deals primarily with the ministry of Paul. So let's uh, have a look at what we're going to learn from Acts chapter 8 this morning. It's verses 4 to 25 for your Bible reading. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the gospel going to Samaria. it's, uh, I've used this image, as you can see. It's from uh, uh, Avanzino Nucci, who painted this image uh, on, in 1620. And uh, it depicts uh, several of the characters in our story today, the Apostle Peter and John, <coughs> who are mentioned in Acts uh, chapter 8. And also this character here, Simon Magus, whom... Uh, We know Simon the sorcerer or the magician. The word magus is actually the singular of magi. That is the sorcerers, the wise men from the east who studied the stars and who came to the birth of Christ in the the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, This Simon, uh, we'll hear a bit more about him in the course of our reflection this morning, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, And the Holy Spirit is depicted as the dove, Uh, at the very top of the picture and it's the Holy Spirit that is our theme this morning and in fact the theme is uh, a Samaritan Pentecost now uh, there are four things I want to share and the first thing is this uh, the Samaritans and the curse I've called it the curse of prejudice they're going to be the deacon named Philip and we're going to see that he is a true servant of the word of God Then we're going to look at Peter, John, and the Holy Spirit. How did they get up there and why? And then we're going to think about Simon, Simon the sorcerer, and the possibility of becoming a Holy Spirit trader. How did that go down? So these are the points that I want to bring us to this morning. Let's think, first of all, then, of the Samaritans. Who were they? Well, it's testament to the power of Jesus' storytelling that when people think of Samaritans today, they think of the good Samaritans. We think of uh, that, uh, that story of Jesus in Luke 10 has so embedded itself in Western psyche that we, we think about the good Samaritan. Who were the Samaritans, however, and why was there hostility between them and the Jewish people? So let's just think about that. In the world of Solomon's day, here's a satellite photograph of Israel today, and it's overlaid the boundaries of Solomon's Israel. And Solomon had uh, that whole area that we know. He had uh, not only the West Bank, but the East Bank of the Jordan, right up almost to the Golan Heights and down to the Gulf of Aqaba. This was Solomon's Israel. And uh, at at the death of Solomon... The United Kingdom, the United Monarchy, as we call it, to separate it from that other United Kingdom uh, that we know and love, Uh, the United Monarchy fell apart. The story is there in the books of Kings, and it's a sad tale. But uh, it was divided into the Northern Kingdom of Israel. There were ten tribes who formed the Northern Kingdom, a coalition, And they didn't want to uh, be connected with uh, those who followed in the footsteps of Rehoboam. So it was Jeroboam and his followers in the north, and Rehoboam and the two tribes in the south, Judah, substantial tribe, and little Benjamin. And they were centered in uh, Jerusalem. And of course, the word Jew comes from uh, Judah. So... This was the legacy after the death of Solomon that the kingdom fell apart. And, and the people in the north uh, established uh, their own places of worship and, and uh, they were eventually, after being governed by a series of terrible kings, they were overwhelmed by the Assyrians and taken into captivity and the, the place was resettled 
And the people in the south always felt that they were impure and they weren't really Jewish up there. And uh, eventually, however, the southern kingdom itself was overwhelmed by the Babylonians. We know the stories from uh, Jeremiah and uh, the, the prophets. We remember the story of Daniel and how Daniel kept thinking about Jerusalem and praying to, to his home country, country, the place from which he'd been taken. So those two deportations, the one in 722 when the Assyrians came, and then a century and a half or so later when the Babylonians came in uh, 586. So that, that was the overwhelming of the, of the Israelites. But eventually, eventually, some came back. And they established Jerusalem again. You know the stories from uh, the, the books of uh, uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. And so, so we have a, a relocation, uh, return of the exiles to Jerusalem. And these people in the, uh, Jerusalem, they felt that the, the Jews to the north, their, their distant cousins, as it were, had... had uh, been false and had forsaken the covenant of their God. Uh, they felt that they themselves were the real Jews. They were the true believers. And they had nothing to do with it. In fact, their, their prejudice against the people of the north was so strong and it was reciprocated. They, they had no dealings with each other. And so when Jesus came to tell his story about the, the priest on the way down from the Jerusalem temple and seeing the, the body of a person by the roadside he chose to walk past on the other side and then the Levite a temple assistant did the same thing wouldn't touch the person in case they were dead and then finally somebody coming down that road uh, went across and lifted him and bathed him with oil and wine and the oil being the, the, the emollient, emollient and the wine being the antiseptic in those days and and so his wounds were dressed. And, and who was this man? This man who acted like a neighbor, said Jesus. Who was it? The Samaritan. So Jesus tells that story. And we think about the Samaritans in that way. But how easily can we slip into thinking that we are the real believers? People like us, our sort of people. Well, a large part of my life... Uh, I've thought of us about believers as white, uh, um, uh, sort of Anglo-centric, Anglo-Celtic, uh, sort of is the way I've thought of the church. But some 20 odd years ago, maybe more, uh, I heard a man speaking in Surrey Hills Presbyterian Church and he described himself as milk chocolate in color. He was brown. And uh, he was... He invited us to guess where he came from, and it was impossible, really. He's, uh, he, he could have come from North Africa. He could have come from Spain. He could have come from the Middle East. He could have come from Iran. He could have come from Central America, almost. So he was that color of that per, those people that live across that whole belt uh, through the, that runs north and south of the equator. And so he invited us to think about Christian people, not just as like ourselves, but often as different from us. And then even uh, more recently, but still quite a long time ago, maybe 15 years or so, I went with a daughter-in-law, Susan, to see, uh, hear a man speak at the Richmond Temple. And uh, he was from the underground church and we wondered why we had to wait. There were hundreds of us waiting to get in and it was already half an hour before the service uh, began. And eventually if we got to the opening glass doors, and went through, we realized that the auditorium was already full. It had a couple of thousand people in it. And we were invited to sit cross-legged on the floor of the foyer. And they put up a big screen so we could see what happened in the auditorium. And the man who spoke, spoke in Mandarin through an interpreter, we heard him say that if, if we hadn't got used to Mandarin yet, we would have to because Mandarin was, there's going to be a lot of Mandarin spoken in heaven. And that drew me up. Could it be that the church was growing rapidly in China? Well, obviously it has been and it's become a problem to the authorities there who, who want to maintain an atheist government. 
And so the growth of the church in China and the spread among Mandarin-speaking people and Cantonese people and, and people who speak all so many different languages. Well, we've known that the church is growing in other places. But we need to remember that the majority church now is not white Anglo-Celtic. It possibly speaks Spanish. The church growth in, in Latin America has been enormous. So we need to bear in mind that we don't have prejudices that say, well, they're not true believers like us. We need to be open and have a spirit of gentleness and acceptance and uh, not think it's just going to be people with our skin color or our language or our ethnicity. So uh, let us avoid that because this was one of the great problems in uh, the Jewish world of Jesus' day. And into this world went Deacon Philip. Now, how did Philip go up there? I think of it going up because it's north of Jerusalem, but of course, uh, the Bible says he went down. They, they, they talked about going down from Jerusalem because Jerusalem was a high point. And whenever you left Jerusalem, you went down. And so we recall that Philip was one of the deacons. It was his job to serve tables, to make sure there was a fair allocation of food or resources for the widows. I mean, we're talking about people who had no real clout. And this was him. He was there to look after them. And with the persecution that we saw a month ago when we spoke about Stephen, we discovered that all except the apostles were scattered. We're not told why the apostles weren't scattered. Possibly they were more at home and embedded in the community there. But that the others who had come from different parts, from uh, all around the Mediterranean and the Middle East, and had gathered there and heard their own languages spoken, these people were now under pressure to get out of there, and they fled back to where they came from. And uh, in the ensuing chaos, they went home. And as they went, as they escaped, the apostle, the man who was to become the apostle Paul, Saul was ravaging the church, entering people's homes and imprisoning them. And so as they scattered in all directions, the great theme of their conversation was what had happened in Jerusalem. They were talking about Jesus. In fact, the text says, if you read your Bible in Acts 8, they were preaching the good news about Jesus. Uh, the message version says, wherever they were scattered, they preached the message about Jesus. And this reminds us that preaching isn't just something that happens in an auditorium uh, to, to uh, uh, passive people. It's something that we can do as we share in our ordinary conversation the things that are most precious in our lives, the things that uh, we have come to love because of the one we adore and who has loved us. So Philip went north and he was telling of Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, and his ministry was accomplishing great things in Samaria. It was, uh, a, a, there were wonders, there were healings, uh, there were awesome, aw awesome things happening. And the text tells us there was great joy in the city, great joy. What a wonderful thing that a city could become a place of joy. So many Samaritans believed and were baptized. Could it be true that the hated Samaritans believed in Jesus? Jesus who'd been uh, down at the temple and crucified outside the city? Could they have received him as their savior? Could Jesus be the forgiver of Samaritan sins? Could a Jewish savior be the savior of Samaritans. What would the apostles think back in Jerusalem? Well, it seems they did think because they sent Peter and John to check it out. It tells us that they came down from Jerusalem to see what was happening and Peter and John laid hands on the baptized Samaritans and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They were believing in Jesus as as the people in Jerusalem had been, and the people in Jerusalem had received the Spirit of God in a way that was tangible, and they prayed for that for the people in Samaria. And they received the Holy Spirit. It was obvious. We're not told how it was obvious, and we're not told how they came to believe in Jesus as if, as if they didn't have the Spirit before. But you can see in the image... Uh, that the Holy Spirit is depicted at the very top of the picture as a dove. 
uh, as the spirit often is. And somebody who was watching was Simon Magus. Now, Simon, as I said, had come in from uh, the East as a, a, a sorcerer, a wise man, an astrologer, somebody who had earned a powerful reputation in the town. And when he saw that the apostles could lay on hands and people could receive the spirit of Jesus, he wanted it. He knew that could make him impressive and important. And, and so he, he wanted that. We'll come to that a little bit more in a minute. He had believed in Jesus and he was excited by what the apostles were doing because what they were doing was virtually authenticating that a Samaritan Pentecost had happened. What had happened in Jerusalem, in the south, at the temple courtyard, in the city of David, was now being replicated here among the Samaritans of all people. And... Uh, I think it's powerful that uh, that uh, the uh, apostles came and ensured that this was this was the authentic thing. This was the real deal. The Spirit's presence was so obvious that signs were were witnessed to uh, which fitted in with the Jerusalem model. But Simon wanted this. He was impressed, and he thought. He could buy the power to do this. How much does it cost? How can I ensure that people get this blessing if I distribute it? And Peter strongly rebuked him in in, uh, very strong terms. Uh, It's not possible to buy or sell the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is God's gift. And today we use the word simony to describe what happens if people do try and trade in religious and spiritual things, try to gain advantage by a spiritual uh, trading and dealing, positions in the church and uh, prestige as a result of uh, what they're doing uh, to, to uh, gain promotion and advancement. Because, of course, the upside-down kingdom of Jesus is that it's the least that shall be first. The first shall be last. The greatest is like the child. So we're, we're made to think again. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're wide-ranging. We don't have all the answers at all in this passage. As I've suggested, we don't know how people could become believers without the Holy Spirit, but we do know that it was authenticated by the apostles' presence, those who had been set apart as witnesses that Jesus had authorized. They ensured that the Spirit was there, was working and poured out on the Samaritans. So what is it that the Spirit brings? Well, the Spirit brings many things. In Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapters uh, 12 and 14, there's also chapter 13, I think, in the middle there, a chapter about love. That's all about the gifts of the Spirit and how they should be regulated and used. Uh, And other places in the New Testament tell us much more about the gifts of the Spirit. And some of those gifts are stunning and awesome, healing to start with. The gift of healing, the gift of tongues, being able to understand other languages and speak in tongues. And there are other things that are given as gifts. But some of the gifts are extraordinarily ordinary, if you can, if you can put those two words together. For example, in, in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the gift of administration. What did he mean? Could it have been something like the deacon Philip had? The ability to ensure fairness in the distribution of the resources that had come in and to treat all the widows as if they were all precious to Christ. That ability to be fair in administration. Or another gift mentioned in Romans 12 that we might think of as very ordinary is the ability to uh, show mercy with cheerfulness. He's thinking... For example, of visiting the sick and bringing cheer to them. What a great gift that is. You know, it's, 
I've, I've visited people in hospital and they've wanted to change the topic to how are you? And the temptation is to start to talk about yourself. But really what you're there for is not to say how comfortable you're feeling, but to try and lift their spirits and, and help them feel that they too are treasured, even though they're going through dark times at the moment. And so the gifts of the Spirit are God's to give, and they may be ordinary or they may be extraordinary, but they're God's to give, not ours to grab. So how do we know about the presence of the Spirit? Well, I want to suggest that we find it in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit should be known by all of us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, just like in Samaria. Peace, patience, kindness. Hugh McKay had a good article in response to a few questions in the newspaper this weekend about kindness. What would it take to make Australia the kind nation, a kind nation? How would it be if the world thought about Australia as a kind place? It would have to begin with us, wouldn't it? We'd have to be that kind person ourselves. So kindness, uh, uh, gentleness, self-control, patience, faithfulness, the nine things that embody the fruit of the Spirit. And, and these, th these are us, ours to nurture. This fruit of this, this Christ likeness should be part uh, of every Christian's life. And here was Simon the sorcerer, and he was hoping that he could trade it, he could, he could acquire the gift to give it and uh, be like the apostles. But no, it's not something you can trade in. You can pray for the, the gifts of the Spirit. And God will and has, I'm sure, blessed you uh, with gifts that will serve his church. But you must nurture the fruit of the Spirit in your life day by day. What would it be like if we moved in this direction? I just thought this extract from uh, Greg Sheridan in The Australian yesterday spoke a lot to our situation. Let me just go over it with you. He's talking about Trumpism and its impact on evangelicalism in America and the Christian cause. And he's talking about the need for Christians to engage with culture. He says this, Continued engagement with the culture, insistence on proclaiming the truth, but taking victory and defeat, both with good cheer, Politics is downstream of culture. Politics is important, but it can't fix culture. Human example, creative institutions, sustained formation, these can change culture and the world. The world cannot afford to lose everything evangelicals contribute. The Acts of the Apostles describes how a Christian church should look. They spent their time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives will strengthen us to model the needed human example, to establish the creative institutions and to support the sustained formation in your life and mine of the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. Let us pray that that might be the case. I'm going to pray before we close. Loving Father, draw near to us as we think about the scriptures and your generosity in the giving of your Son and the pouring out of your Spirit. Mold us to his image. Help us to live as your children in the week that lies ahead. May our lives reveal the fruit of your spirit. Take from us all that is offensive and gather us anew as your children as we seek to serve you and wait upon you at this time. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.